Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming to uh, this talk here, um, creating a sustainable open source ecosystem for mainframe through the open mainframe project. And, you know, when I talk with people about open source and mainframe, they often sort of wonder of how these things actually come together. Um, some people even, you know, first, maybe you have to start explaining what a mainframe is to people. Um, but more when I just kind of bring both of these topics together, people really aren't sure of how they even connect and where they would intersect and, and what have you. And what's interesting is mainframes, open source's roots actually start with mainframe. If we go back to 1955, there was a new computer that IBM had put out, and this is sort of a predecessor computer to what we consider sort of the modern mainframe architecture called the IBM 7, Model 704. And a user group got together in the Los Angeles area to kind of talk about this machine and kind of you know go back between ideas of how to use it, how to share some of the code and, and programs that one would program on this. This built up over time. And what this route here was, is this first meeting um, was the first meeting of an organization called SHARE, which still exists to this day. Um, but it really is, if you're talking open source and you're really wanting to go to the roots of the open source movement, this is where you start back in 1955 with this group of mainframe operators collaborating on source code. Um, they didn't have the internet available. They probably didn't have the same um, you know, means available, but you know, they different medium of how they would use. This is where it all started. This is really where the root of open source actually um, comes from. It's all thanks to the mainframe. And, and that's a common theme you hear sometimes if you talk with people in the mainframe world, you know, you bring up a technology topic of the day and they say, oh, geez, we did it in a mainframe decades ago. Well, as it turns out, open source is one of those as well. Um, and that tradition continues through to today. And uh, of the IBM Z15, which is the latest um, you know, mainframe that was um, introduced last year, the heritage of those early models continues on. And all of the design principles that came in that model IBM 704, you know, through the early system 360s um, up to the Z machines of today, it all it all roots itself back into here. Um, and if you just look at this machine here, just from the, the sheer specs of it, um, it kind of blows you away. But what's really important to think about here is how this system has been designed. It has been designed along the principles of security, availability, performance, and scalability. Um, and organizations that turn to this platform, they need all of those turned up to an 11. And that's why they end up choosing mainframe. But let's shoot back to open source here, because um, that's what we're talking about. And you know, this early collaboration that we saw from Share in the 1950s, um, it continued on through decades. Um, in 1975, a project was founded called CBT Tape. Um, CBT stands for Connecticut Bank and Trust, which is a bank that has been defunct for many decades. But one of the early uh, mainframers there, um, he pulled together all of this public domain and all of these utilities and things that have been worked on in these various share user groups and put it together as a canonical tape and distributed it. Um, you can actually still today uh, send him an email or send him a letter um, and a little bit of money and he'll send you um, all the CBT pay project on tape itself. This is actually really one of the oldest open source projects. It actually predates not only open source, but even the free software movement. Um, and But it was the continuing build of this collaboration that we've seen in the mainframe space. 1999, uh, Linux, which has already been a thing for many years at that point, was pointed ported to the S390X platform. And we saw community efforts from Marist universities. We saw work in some of the IBM Germany labs, uh, another, a, a bunch of other enthusiasts in the space uh, also were working and pulled together to bring Linux to this platform um, known by its architectural uh, indication of S390X. And from there, we saw Linux distribution supporting it with SUSE as one of the initial ones with Red Hat and others following, the growth of customers and that critical mass that, that is happening um, you know, with all sorts of different open source projects coming to the mainframe. 
So the question that we often sort of get asked when we when we talk about sort of open source in this line is, um, you know, open source isn't, you know, slowing down anytime soon and, and the growth continues. Um, and this is something we're just broadly seeing all over. And what ends up being really interesting is where, you know, where we're seeing open source code being used. Um, and if we talk about, you know, a platform such as Mainframe, which, you know, many believe is a very proprietary platform, the reality is, is a lot of the code that's being brought together um, is dependent upon open source. And we actually see the same pattern just across the industry as well, where um, there's, a, you know, a framework underneath which is open source powered. There's libraries that are solving some of the common problems that are powered by open source. And really there's that custom code in the middle that isn't. So we're almost seeing 90% of that code is actually open source. So that means there's a lot of open source out there. And the question is, is which projects matter? Um, and the real answer is, is all projects matter. But um, the really the ones that you know we try to focus on are the ones that have a huge impact um, on our society. But more importantly, they have um, large sustainable ecosystems. And you know, this is sort of the model that we look to help drive here, um, not only the Open Mainframe Project, but the Linux Foundation. Um, you know, projects are where we put our focus on. The success of those projects find their way into products or internal usage. That um, means there is savings for an organization on R&D cost or greater profits from taking the product to market. All of that drives back into the project and the circle continues. So what we're focused on here is a sustainable ecosystem. Um, and sustainability, when we talk about it, it's about longevity. Sustainability, uh, the term itself even comes from sustainability. And if you put those together, it's a property of systems to remain diverse and productive indefinitely. And if we think about the mainframe and architecture that has been around for decades and decades, uh, sustainability is the name of the game. And that is really where this community is continue has focused and is continuing to focus going forward. Now, if we look at ecosystems around uh, the mainframe, you know, and this is kind of a very common thing we often see in a lot of places here, is that these ecosystems that form um, have challenges. And if we look at sort of the path in which we've went through um, from mainframe, the early days of share to the CBT tape to Linux coming to the platform, um, there's a lot of community activity happening, but at some point, there's a glass ceiling that gets hit. Um, some of it's caused by, you know, just this fragmentation that happens in the market from just all sorts of, you know, different efforts that are competitive, overlapping um, with one another. Um, the governance of how one gets involved in a project can be a little bit complicated with, um, you know, favoring of governance um, towards the people who created the project. Um, and it's sort of being very dominated that way. Um, a lack of an ecosystem being built um, and even just sort of, you know, kind of basic things, but really important of, you know, owning of assets and, um, you know, who's sort of managing the essential health of the projects. This is really what led to the open mainframe project. There was already a very vibrant open source community here, but it got to that point where bringing this into a vendor neutral entity, all of it was needed to get to that next set of innovation. And Innovation certainly have been the project. Uh, we just had our, the project had its fifth birthday this year, um, launched in 2015 at Open uh, at LinuxCon Seattle. Um, and it was seeded with the first project of ADE, um, Atom Anomaly Detection Engine for Linux Log, still a, a great project here for today. Um, and this project continued to grow. And, you know, I think there's a couple really great milestones that we've seen along the way of this innovation acceleration. One of just the a mentorship program forming in 2016, which has brought um, lots of new open source to the platform. Alpine Linux was ported by one of our first mentees, um, but we've also seen big contributions to OpenStack, Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, uh, Hyperledger, um, and a number of other open source projects. It brought in the focus out um, of really looking into the ZOS community and bringing it um, into the fold and helping drive open source there with the launch of Zoe two years ago, um, which has been really the first ever open source project launched in the ZOS platform. 
and has seen some huge growth um, ever since. But it's also brought in this tidal wave of new projects. 2019, we launched five new projects so far in 2020. We've lost, launched six um, with several more um, in the wings. And I think what we're starting to see here is more and more folks in the mainframe world are embracing this concept of vendor neutral collaboration and bringing these great efforts uh, to the open mainframe project. So why are we here? What's the mission of this project? Well, it's very simple. We want to build community and adoption of open source in the mainframe. And there's three ways that this project does that. One is by eliminating the barriers to open source adoption on the mainframe um, by providing access to hardware, better education, um, and helping connect talent to one another, demonstrating the value of the mainframe on technical and business levels. And really what the most important thing that any foundation can do, strengthening those collaboration points. And we're going to talk a lot about those collaboration points as we sort of move through the slides today here. You know, here's just as we kind of dig more into those barriers and things that are, are happening there around career growth, um, showcasing the modern um, application workloads and driving global initiatives for the platform. Um, you know, being able to champion and, and showcase what's happening um, with the mainframe through business case studies and blog posts and, you know, other media out there. Um, and the collaboration point of bringing um, projects together, providing tools and infrastructure, um, and having a mentorship program to help bring new folks into the fold here. And what we have created here is this amazing space for open source collaboration on the mainframe here with 15 projects. Um, currently hosted by the foundation. And you can learn more at openmainframeproject.org slash projects on that. But also I would encourage you to take a look at the open mainframe landscape. And as it turns out, there's a much even broader view of what's going on in the open source on mainframe world. And you can check out here l.openmainframeproject.org where you can see what the rest of the open source projects on mainframe look like, um, including um, offerings that are happening from the Zoe conformance world, um, along with the Linux distributions and other projects and the member companies that are behind this. So I want to kind of deep dive into a few of these projects here of what's going on, but more of just sort of looking at um, the big picture of, of how all these uh, projects are connecting together and driving um, new innovation. So we mentioned Zoe and Zoe has been a real revolutionary project um, for the ZOS community. The big challenge that that community has had for many, many, many years is it's just a different operating system um, than what, norm, what, what the typical uh, you know, student um, or application developer or DevOps person um, is familiar with. It's just different. Um, it's not good, bad, or otherwise. It's just very different. And Organizations suffer this way because it ends up having just a huge talent gap of being able to support, you know, their ZOS infrastructure versus the rest of the infrastructure. Um, you know, DevOps tools have been really good about bridging across Linux and um, Windows and Mac OS and different cloud environments. But to the ZOS world, that really hadn't got there yet, at least the, the common tools that uh, you see in operations environments today. So the idea with Zoe is, what if we modernize the integration um, with those services? So as opposed to working through um, what folks might refer to as a green screen um, or a 3270 terminal, um, which is probably the more formal name to it. What if we provide REST APIs? What if there was a command line interface? What if there was a way to build a web app um, using you know, modern JavaScript components? Uh, help, how can we moder moder modernize that integration with ZOS-based applications and services? And then the second, and this sort of leads into it of, you know, this just being different, ZOS being different, there's a talent gap. Um, and how can enabling and bringing these modern tools and integration strategies um, enable modern development stacks, but use that as a tool that bridges that talent gap? So these are the challenges that came. Um, and Zoe launched 2018 um, as really the first step towards that. Uh, 
it was a huge project in 2019. They they got to their 1.0 release in very early uh, 2019, which is a huge actual feat um, for the amount of code that came between uh, all three of the initial contributing organizations of, I, of Broadcom, IBM, and Rocket Software. And at the same time, they launched a conformance program. And we're seeing these more and more in open source. And it's a great way for the community to help add definition to what the downstream ecosystem looks like um, and able to add clarity to say that you're taking this project and you're using it in a conformant way. You're using it in a way that it's designed from how the community's envisionment of having this large ecosystem of applications and tooling that can integrate and leverage this as a platform. The conformance program sets those boundaries there and then gives marks for organizations to be able to talk to that. And we, you know, with such a, a large project and a lot of moving pieces, um, you know, we spent tremendous time investing in collaboration tooling, ecosystem development, infrastructure, you know, getting Zoe, um, you know, at various DevOps events, but also, you know, very widely recognized in the open source world as well. This is a whole new world to ZOS of, you know, talking about ZOS at an open source conference, such as All Things Open, um, isn't something that it probably would have happened before 2018, but now it is happening. Um, and there's huge investments that have happened in that area. What does that meant? 2020, all time, over 20,000 commits and 200 different committers all time to the project. Um, a real, real fascinating number and a real huge testament to the amount of effort and innovation that is being pushed into this project. Uh, Zoe as a project is actually getting a lot of mind share in the DevOps world. Um, it's you continuously been at the top of DevOps dozen lists and other um, you know industry analyst list as well. And we're seeing more and more times where Zoe is just being introduced into that conversation as a way to unify uh, an organization's IT environment. And that downstream ecosystem that we created back in uh, 2019 with the launch of the conformance program. To date, and, and I think this number is actually probably low, I think we're closer to 30 plus Zoe conformant offerings on the market. Um, and we've seen them from, um, to date, five different organizations pushing those. So we're already seeing growth out of the initial contributing organizations, but we're seeing larger business partners and other software vendors saying that, hey, we want to, we see this ecosystem as valuable and we're building upon this as we take Zoe to market. So a fascinating story there that we're seeing um, unfold. And certainly in 2021, we're going to see a lot more to come here. So let's switch over to another project, uh, Phelong, um, which is, you know, if you if you sat in Elizabeth Joseph's session earlier today, I did get, catch a good portion of it. She talked about um, ZVM as sort of a, a hypervisor before um, most of the hypervisors that we know today. Um, and, and actually a very, very good one um, for the amount of technology and innovation that has been put into it. This is the standard within mainframe shops is ZVM. The challenge is where organizations have been using cloud stack technologies such as OpenStack um, or Kubernetes um, or others um, as sort of that technology for you know, effectively maintaining an internal cloud environment. Um, and ZVM didn't have the greatest way to connect with that. There, you know, there had been some tooling that's been put in place, but it really wasn't, um, you know, very scalable. Um, and there was a work on sort of redoing um, a lot of this project. And the challenge was it was very much um, IBM was driving it. And, you know, not that we do not, definitely the community does not appreciate uh, contributions from IBM, but you know, that becomes very unsustainable. You become one vendor that is holding up an entire ecosystem that is looking to really drive forward. Um, and there was definitely business partners in the area that were also looking at this like, you know, we see this as a very promising technology, but we need to help bring this into a vendor neutral entity to really drive and get that larger adoption. 2019 Open Mainframe Project, we brought Feilong in. Um, and what was really interesting um, as they formed their initial uh, TSC, which stands for Technical Steering Committee, they didn't have somebody from IBM that led it. They had co-chairs from SUSE and Velocity Software, um, which was very interesting. And it was a very, you know, tip of the hat um, to knowing that you we are the, that project is really driving 
towards getting a diverse set of organizations involved. And with that, they've been working on building an open CICD infrastructure and development environment. Um, so this code can continue to be built out. Where we're at in 2020, um, we're seeing even more organizations um, start to take part, um, leverage the technology and work to push um, things upstream. Um, and it's become sort of this interesting hub of innovation. And we're even seeing some of these vendors that might have went off and built their own solutions in this space, uh, they're actually starting to rebase and they're starting to look at Phalong um, as the base of work. So it's really, really fascinating. So COBOL, um, COBOL has been in the news quite a bit. Um, and uh, you might recall from uh, back in April, um, there were some state governors that uh, got on the air and, and said, hey, we don't have COBOL talent to maintain some of the infrastructure that is being uh, very overstressed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and the, the thought at the time was, oh, geez, there's all these tools being written out there. There's all this COBOL code out there, but there's nobody to maintain it. So we got together, um, you know, we pulled together as a community here and we had, uh, you know, IBM and several other vendors really, you know, come to the forefront here and say, you know, let's try to do something as a community here to, um, to really tackle this. So let's not take this as a term of offense that COBOL there's something wrong with COBOL, but you know, let's come together a community because these organizations need it. Um, and furthermore, it wasn't just important to have a flash in the pan, but what was really important is how do we create COBOL sustainability? How do we make sure that the next time that this comes up, that there's still not this same problem of nobody knows where to find a COBOL programmer, right? it changes sort of that, that whole game quite a bit. And so we're not having all these skills in isolation. So can we enable that next generation? Can we get a new set of people, um, COBOL skills, so that they can um, be ready to jump in here? So we innovated, and we innovated very quickly. Um, you know, within the fact, within this hitting the news to the time we had an announcement out there, um, was about a week. Um, just to give a really a good sense of context. And there's a couple ways that we focused on here. One is we uh, launched a COBOL programming course um, as an open source project, um, which was proposed by IBM and a number of other organizations in April 2020. And what was really, really interesting about this project is um, it was accepted by the Technical Advisory Council and sort of soft launched. The code hadn't got there, but started to make its way onto Hacker News and things like that. As we were getting up the GitHub repository to put the code in, we didn't even have all the code up and we were already starting to get, you know, hundreds of stars on GitHub from it and people already beginning to fork it. Um, and we haven't even announced where the code is going to be. Like that's how early on and how much excitement was out there. Um, and uh, to date, you know, we've had, you know, over 1,700 people star this on GitHub. They're watching this with over 300 forks. Um, and this is in a short amount of time. I mean, this is, you know, literally since April. So this is just a few months um, and a growing base of contributors and just tons of people that are actually using this coursework and they're building and they're going through it and they're learning COBOL. Um, and we've even seen more innovation happening on that coursework to support different IDEs and, you know, different technologies. Um, so it's, it's been a really, really amazing um, feat there. The second thing that we thought of is, you know, our, our hunch was this talent was very much out there. So how can we connect the talent to the need? And what we provisioned out there were collaboration forums and technical forums around COBOL and particularly one we called calling all COBOL programmers, where we said, look, if you're, if you're COBOL talent and you're available um, for hire or even volunteer work, put your name here. Um, we had almost a thousand individuals sign up for that within a week. Um, and to date, we've had over 1700 individuals make themselves available um, either for hire or for volunteer work. And these aren't people towards the end of their careers. Um, these are um, people mid-career, beginning career. They're people from different nationalities, different genders, different races, different backgrounds, different ages. Um, it's a really, really diverse group. 
Um, and I think it opened a lot of people's eyes of what was going on in the COBOL world. Um, and also since then, we've also launched a COBOL working group, which has brought together people from academia, but also different vendors in the space as they're looking towards the future of COBOL and how we can maintain, how this community can maintain sustainability, because this is going to be a cornerstone, um, you know, of our technology lifecycle um, for a long time. And we talked about this very much earlier here, the mentorship program. And, you know, I won't, I won't beleaguer it too much here, but um, I think we've seen a huge interest of students wanting to get involved in mainframe. And, you know, one of the numbers that I don't throw on this slide, and I probably should, is that each year we have had, you know, somewhere between a 40 to 60% growth in applicants for this program there is tons of interest of students wanting to get involved in mainframe. And this mentorship has been a great way to get that going. Um, and what's actually really interesting is not only is the work very meaningful, I mean, it's making um, upstream contributions to many, many large open source projects, um, but it's also went back into universities where we have Virginia Commonwealth University and Western University of Ontario, which has uh, used this program in their classwork. Um, so they're you know, training and working and getting students familiar with the mainframe there. And the back end of this is that these mentees that are coming in this program, they're staying in the mainframe world. Um, and they're employed by you know, organizations like IBM, SUSE, um, ADP, but you know, also a ton more business partners out there. So it's really, really been a fantastic story. So, I mean, I think the, the, the genesis of this here is, you know, we're seeing innovation thrive. And, you know, we as an organization, um, we provide the infrastructure. Um, we, as a staff, um, have great guidelines and great expertise of how you grow open source. Um, and, you know, we let this natural collaboration happen and, and, and we're here to provide that space. And we've just seen it kind of been time and time again. And you can learn a little bit more about um, the processes of, of how projects come in um, at, the web, at the link below there. So it's not just supporting mainframe centric projects, but we're also looking at beyond um, that just hosting projects here. One of the big things, and, and this is actually something um, that has been going on you know, for over two decades now, um, for some of you who might remember an organization called the uh, Open Source Development Labs, OSDL. Um, it's a predecessor organization to the Linux Foundation, but it had an early partnership um, with Marist College of providing infrastructure for these open source projects that wanted to support mainframe. Well, that's carried through to today here, and we actually have a much more formal program um, that is wrapping it in as a part of our Empitus project, um, where we help provide projects, um, broad open source projects, infrastructure, connecting them to developers, making the market aware of them, um, you know, so that these projects can support the mainframe um, and they can support it as a first class citizen. And, you know, just some of the projects below are just a few examples of ones um, that we've worked with over the last several years, but that's just really it's really a great way that um, the open mainframe project is able to help give back to these communities. It's not just that they dump code on and say, hey, support mainframe, this is what you have to do. But they look to make positive impacts upstream with all of their contributions. Um, even as I've, I've talked with um, Linux kernel maintainers, they've even said that the contributions that they get from the mainframe community are some of the, strong, the, the best contributions from a technical quality standpoint um, that they see. And I think this is a, a fine testament to the great level of technical um, skill and discipline that we see, um, you know, out of this community. Another huge piece that we really want to focus on is letting people know who a real mainframer is. And I know that's sort of a funny thing to say, um, you know, off the cuff like that. But, you know, so often people have thought um, mainframer means somebody, their end of their career, um, perhaps, you um, you know, uh, you know, a male, perhaps um, white. Um, that's not really the case at all. Um, we've started this podcast series a few years ago and with the idea that let's highlight who mainframers are and let's do it from a very diverse base, you know, so people new in their career, older in their career, people from different backgrounds, races, genders, ethnicities, locales, 
um, you know, different roles within the mainframe, both kind of developer, but maybe also in a leadership roles as well. And the big thing that we really want to dig into is why do people decide to have a career in mainframe? Like why, why did they do it? What draws them to it? Why do they, why do they continue to have a career here and where do they see it coming and what advice would they give to others coming into this? Um, this is recorded as a podcast. It's on your favorite podcast app, whether that's iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, you name it, it's on there. Um, and you can also find the recordings on our website and the transcripts as well. It's a really, really great series. If there's nothing else, I would encourage you to start there um, and kind of check out that podcast series. And we spend a lot of time with just making sure there's an open collaborative space um, around mainframe here. Um, you know, certainly we have the community forums, which we spoke to as before, which sees a lot of vibrancy. We have a Slack channel um, where all of our projects communicate and collaborate with one another. Um, and we also have just launched um, our annual event, Open Mainframe Summit. We just did it last month. It was a huge success. We really brought together the open source on mainframe community um, for the first time really ever. Um, and it, we, we saw great feedback, some great collaboration, um, and a lot of new networking and, and relationships started from that point there. Um, and this is a real focal point for us as a foundation. So by the numbers, you know, we're five years, oops, uh, we're five years into this and with almost 40, with almost 40 organizations supporting the 15 hosted projects and working groups, the outcomes have been over 40 mentees over well over 100 students and 200 pro, 280 plus probably 300 plus now project contributors um, driving forward this ecosystem. Um, it's really been an amazing and it's all thanks um, to not only the people in the community but also the organizations and the logos that you see here that believe in the work that is happening in the open mainframe project um, and focus on that that continued growth and drive. So you might be asking yourself, how do you get involved? Well, there's a lot of different ways. Um, it's a very open participation and you know, certainly getting involved in the community discussion and collaboration, both virtually as we will likely be doing for quite some time, um, but also um, at events when those come back together. Um, definitely engage and find us. We always have, um, uh, we're always at all the open mainframe summits and we try to get a great events like all things open as well um, to, you know, to, really show support, but also um, network with everybody out there. Um, 15 projects um, participate, or if you have a project that you think would fit really well here, um, come bring it here. The Technical Advisory Council accepts new projects all the time. And if you're an organization that sees mainframe as an important part of your business, um, consider um, corporate sponsorship and it showcases stewardship and it really helps make this community move forward. So if you want to learn more about Open Mainframe Project, a lot of different ways here. First, head to the website, www.openmainframeproject.org. You can find our newsletter. I would encourage you to sign up for it. Um, we usually get uh, at least a note out about every month um, talking about some of the great things that are happening in our community and ways to get involved. Um, so certainly use that as a first starting point. Two, um, discover our projects. And we just talked about that again. I'll harp on it again. They're all here, open mainframe project org slash projects. They are all open, transparent. They, anybody in the community can get involved with them and just learn more. So by all means, jump right in there um, and uh, you know, see what's interesting. And we also talked about um, you know, getting involved as an organization. And if that is something of interest, you know, you can learn more, um, the about join page, you can email membership at, and you can talk to me um, and uh, we can do it through all of the things online as well. So with that, I wanna thank everyone for coming. Um, I know this is the end of the day here. So this is uh, the last thing that kind of is between uh, you and, uh, I, I would say normally if we were in an in-person conference, this is between you and the exhibit hall um, um, social, but, Maybe this is between you and dinner um, or you and something else. So um, I want to thank you for sticking with us here. And uh, definitely um, come check us out. And uh, happy to answer any questions, although I don't really see any in the Q&A here. So I think I must have answered just about everybody's question, which is a good sign. I have a question. Go for it. <laughs> this actually... Um interested me a lot. And the reason is because 
I've I've heard a lot about you know government having issues and and some universities having uh, code that they have to um, that they're having to port or they might want to port or probably not just maintaining. So I was wondering how does the open source part of this or does it relate to government and larger institutions who just have mainframes and have not gotten off of them? You know, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, and it, it's really kind of interesting because, you know, a lot of sort of, I think the underlying we alluded to is, you know, that, that so much of this technology has been out there and, and just sort of humming along in the background and doing its job, which, you know, if you say that's, that's, that's a good hallmark of any technology is it just does its job and it doesn't create a lot of fuss. It doesn't create a lot of attention. It just does it. Um, so I, I think as we're sort of like looking at the intersection with open source, I think what, what is happening in organizations is there's just so many different ways that applications and data are being managed and being delivered. Um, you know, not just cloud, but we're seeing edge computing. Um, we're seeing different sorts of um, infrastructure and hardware being put together, much of this across different locales. Um, you know, the average organization is is seeing, you know, their data um, in many, 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 many different places. And mainframe just happens to be one of them. But the real challenge an organization runs into is how can it help pull some of these data streams together um, to drive value um, for them internally and also for their customers. And what we have seen is open source ends up being that glue because this is a very common problem that is across everywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, that is, that I think is, we're starting to see is sort of the new driver out there. You open source and, and you learned a lot about it at this conference and, and many others is becoming the glue that pulls together an organizational's digital strategy, their application strategy, their data strategy, um, and having mainframe now become a citizen in there all of a sudden makes this architecture not only relevant, but on the flip side, and we talked about in the earlier part of this architecture having some very unique properties here of security um, and performance and availability and safe scalability that cannot be done on any other platform that are can't you can't even do in the cloud. Um, if you need applications that can that need that sort of level um, of uh, service you can float them right to a mainframe and you can manage it just like you do for the rest of the organization. Um, so it's really, it's really helped an organization. I mean, you know, you hear things like microservices and I think like that's probably one of the greatest things you know, for mainframes out there is because you can float the services that make sense in a mainframe there. You can float the ones that make sense on an edge node to there, the float the ones that make sense in the cloud and over there. So there's really just a lot of different areas that um, you can push your applications there. So. Yeah, I think open source is just this enabling technology that is just pulling everything together. And now mainframe is right there as a citizen, um, as a part of that. Um, hopefully I got somewhere close to answering your question.